Hey, we're back with the Hardy Boys, the secret of the oil. While I'm waiting for my pizza rolls to cool down, I figured I'd go ahead and read chapter nine. Tracing a slugger. When Frank regained consciousness, his first thought was of his brother. He turned his throbbing head and saw that Joe was lying to him. Joe, he exclaimed anxiously. To his relief, to his relief, Joe was stirring and mumbling. What happened? Someone conked us on the head. Frank broke off as he became aware of a gentle rocking motion. He sat up. Was he still dizzy or were they moving? When his mind and vision cleared, he knew they were certainly moving. Hey, he said, we're on the sleuth. Astonished, Joe raised himself and looked around. They were indeed aboard their boat, lying on the foredeck and slowly drifting down Willow River towards the bay. The anchor lay beside them. A fog's rolling in, Frank said uneasily, observing white swirls of mist ahead. Let's start her up before visibility gets worse. The boys wriggled into the cockpit and Joe pressed the starter. It would not catch. While Joe stayed at the controls, Frank climbed to the foredeck and lifted the cowling from the engine. He quickly checked to see if the distributor wires were in place. They were. There did not seem to be anything visibly wrong with the engine, but when he lifted the top off of the carburetor, he found it empty. A quick check of the gas tank revealed the cause of the trouble. The tank had been drained. Fine mess we're in, he mumbled. What was the idea? The man who hit us on the head can answer that one, Joe said bitterly. He sure did a complete job, even took both the oars. We'll have to tow her, Frank said tersely, to make <clears throat> more speed and guide her. While Joe stripped to his shorts, Frank quickly led a painter through one of the foredeck fair leads. Take this painter, Frank said, handing Joe the rope. Make it fast around your shoulder and swim straight ahead. I'll unhinge one of the battens and use it as a paddle and try to keep her straight. In a few minutes, I'll change places with you. The Hardys knew that keeping a dead weight like the sleuth moving in straight line would be a tough job. However, with Joe swimming ahead and Frank wielding the batten, they managed to make fairly steady progress. It was slow back-breaking work, and before they reached the bay, the boys had changed places three times. Their heads were pounding more than ever from the physical strain. Also, the fog had grown so dense that it was impossible to see very far ahead. Frank, who was taking his turn in the water, did not know how much longer he could go on. Suddenly, Joe shouted from the boat, There's a light! Help! Help! Ahoy! Over here! He directed at the top of his lungs. Gradually, the light approached them. Frank clambered back into the sleuth as the harbor police boat, making its scheduled rounds, pulled alongside. You're just in time, Frank gasped to the sergeant in charge. We're exhausted. I can see that. You run out of gas? The police officer asked. Worse than that. Foul play, Frank replied. Tough luck, the sergeant said. You can tell your story when we get to town. The officer gave orders to his crew and a tow line was put on the sleuth. The boys were given blankets to throw around themselves. When the two crafts reached the Harbor Police Pier, the boys went inside and gave a full account of what happened to them and asked that the report be relayed to Chief Colley. We'll give you some gas, said the sergeant who had rescued the boys. Then do you think you can make it home alone? Yes, thank you. And half an hour later, the, the boys, tired and disappointed, stifled home. Their mother and aunt, with dismay at the sight of the weary boys in water-sodden clothes. Frank and Joe, however, made light of the evening's experience. We ran out of gas, Joe explained, and had to swim back with the sleuth. Aunt Gertrude sniffed skeptically. Hmm. It must have been some long ride to use up all that fuel. She hustled off to make hot chocolate. Mrs. Hardy told the boys that their father had left the house an hour before and would be away overnight working on the case. Again, Frank and Joe wondered about it. 
and did the attack tonight have any connection with either case? After a hot bath and a good night's sleep, Frank and Joe were eager to continue their search for clues to the bowman, the counterfeiters, and the writer of the first warning note to Mr. Hardy. After breakfast, Frank and Joe went to the lab and dusted the archer's finger guard. To the brothers' delight, they lifted one clear print. We'll take this to Chief Colley on our way to the paper company in Bridgeport, Frank decided. Just before they left, Chet telephoned. Guess what? He said to Frank Convincer. I have an appointment at Electon to see about a job. How'd you do that? Frank asked, amazed. You sure work fast, Chet laughed. I decided to telephone on my own, he explained. The man in the personnel office told me that there might be something available on a part-time basis. How about that? Swell, Frank said. The vacancy must have come up since yesterday. Funny thing, Chet added. The personnel manager asked me if I had applied before. I said no, though the guard had phoned about me yesterday. The manager said he didn't remember this, but that somebody else in the office might have taken the call. Chet became more and more excited as he talked about the prospect of getting a job at the electant laboratory. I'm going to make a lot of money and... Don't get your hopes up too high, Frank cautioned his friend. Electin is such a top secret outfit, they might not hire anyone on a part-time basis for lab work. But you might get something else. We'll see, Chet replied optimistically. Joe and I have something special to show you, Frank told him. After you have your interview, meet us at the north end of Bayport waterfront. Chet begged to know why, but Frank kept the news about the sleuth a secret. You'll see soon enough, he said. Okay, then, so long. The Hardys hopped on their motorcycles and rode to the police headquarters. They talked to Chief Colley in detail about the attack on them and left the Bowman's fingerprint for him to trace. Good work, boys, he said. I'll let you know what I find out. Frank and Joe had decided not to mention to him the green truck and its possible connection with the counterfeiters until they had more proof. The boys mounted their motorcycles and rode to Bridgeport. They easily located the quality paper company and inquired there for Mr. Evans, a sales manager with whom they had talked the day before. When Frank and Joe entered his office, they identified themselves. Mr. Evans looked at the brothers curiously, but he was not he was most cooperative in answering their questions. No, Mr. Evans said. We don't sell our star watermark paper to retail stores in the vicinity. All our purchasers are large industrial companies. Here's a list. He handed a printed sheet across the desk to Frank. The boys were disappointed not to have obtained any individual's names. Nevertheless, Frank and Joe read the list carefully. Several names, including Electin Controls Limited, were familiar to them. The warning note could have come from any one of thousands of employees of any of the firms. I guess there's no clue here to the man we wanted to locate, Frank said to Mr. Evans. The boys thanked him. As they started to leave, they called. he called them back. Are you boys by any chance related to Mr. Fenton Hardy? He asked. Joe puzzled, nodded. He's our father, why? Quite a coincidence, Mr. Evans said. Mr. Hardy was here a little while ago. He was? Frank exclaimed in surprise. The brother ex exchanged glances, wondering what mission their father had been on. Maybe I shouldn't have mentioned Mr. Hardy's visit, Mr. Evans said. That's all right, Joe assured him. If Dad wanted to keep his visit a secret, he would have told you. When the boys were outside again, Frank said, I hope Dad will be home. I'd like to find out what brought him here. Frank and Joe rode directly home and were glad to see Mr. Hardy sitting in the driveway. The boys rushed into the house. They found the detective in his study talking on the telephone. The boys paused next to the partly open door. The same eight and one pattern, I believe, their father said. Yes, I'll be there. Goodbye. Frank knocked and the boys entered the room. Mr. Hardy greeted them warmly. He was startled when Joe told him, we know where you've been this morning, Dad. Were you two shadowing me? The detective joked. Not exactly. 
Frank grinned and explained why they had visited the quality paper company. Good idea, said the detective. Did you learn anything? No, Joan replied glumly, then asked suddenly, Dad, did you go to the quality paper in connection with the warning note on the arrow? Mr. Hardy admitted that he had gone there to investigate the watermark. I believe I did find a clue to confirm a suspicion of mine, but I'm not sure yet where it will lead. The boy sensed that their father's trip had been linked to his secret case. If it was to help us on the counterfeiting mystery, he'd said so, Frank thought. And he hasn't mentioned Electon, so I guess he doesn't suspect any of that company employees. Company's employees. Mr. Hardy changed the subject. He looked at his sons quizzically. What's this I hear from Aunt Gertrude about you boys coming home last night half dead? The boys explained, omitting none of the details. We didn't want to alarm Mother and Aunt Gertrude, Frank said, so we didn't tell them about the attack. Mr. Hardy looked grim and warned his sons gravely to be extra cautious. There's one bright spot, he added. The print you found on the finger guard, it could be a big break. During lunch, the detectives, the detective was unusually preoccupied. The boys tried to draw him out by questions and deductions about the counterfeiting case. He would say very little, however, and seemed to be concentrating on a naughty problem. A little later, the boys rode their motorcycle straight to the boathouse and parked at the street end of the jetty. Chet ought to show up soon, Joe remarked. As the brothers walked towards the boathouse, Frank commented on his father's preoccupation during luncheon. I have a hunch Dad's assignment is even tougher than usual, he confided. I wish we could help him on it. Frank seemed to be only half listening and nodding absently. What's the matter with you, Joe laughed. I'm talking to myself. Suddenly, Frank stopped. He grasped his brother's arm firmly. Joe, he said, we may have found a clue in Bridgeport this morning and didn't realize it. And that's the end of chapter nine. Okay, my pizza rolls should be ready now. Maybe I'll read chapter two, 10 as soon as I finish eating them. Thank you for joining me and I will see you later.